So chapter 41 is looking at how species interact with each other. So we're looking more at community, ecolo community ecology here, and I think we should just jump right into it. So um, interspecific interactions are when inters between, right? So this is relationships between species in a community. So this affects the survival and reproduction of each species. And we can classify interactions as either positive, negative, or neutral. And realistically, we can have nearly neutral as well. But uh, if you take ecology, you'll probably get into that there. So this includes competition, um, exploitation, which includes preda predation, herbivory, and parasitism, also mutualism, and commensalism. And we're going to go over each of those coming up. Interspecific competition is competition not within a species but between species. So this is the negative-negative interaction that occurs when species compete for a resource that limits their growth or survival. Strong competition can lead to competitive exclusion where one species is eliminated from a particular area. Um, the competitive exclusion principle says that two species competing for the same limiting resource cannot permanently coexist in the same place. So an ecological niche or niche, depending on how you want to say that, right, um, is the specific set of biotic and abiotic resources that an organism uses. And it can also be thought of as kind of like an organism's ecological role or how an organism makes its living. So ecologically similar species can coexist in a community if there are one or more significant differences in their niche. Um, so that leads us to resource partitioning, which is when you have differentiation in those ecological niches that enable similar species to coexist in a community. So this picture that we've got to the side here so shows resource partitioning in Dominican Republic lizards. Um, so they're pretty similar species, um, although they're making use of different parts of the environment. As you can see, some of them are going to be found um, on you know fence posts and other sunny surfaces um, and others are going to perch on shady branches they're going to be in different parts of um, the trees and different parts of um, the different layers of the habitat as well it's not like they got together and had a meeting and they're like okay i got the bench you got the canopy you got the midstory you got the shrubby layer um but if one of them has a um, like if they're better suited to comp compete in that particular area, then they're going to survive and reproduce, and you'll have more of those that inhabit that particular niche. So an organism's fundamental niche um, might be different than its realized niche. So a fundamental niche is the area that they could potentially occupy, and the realized niche is the, the area that they're actually occupying. Um, so in this picture here, um, you can see the top picture has two different species, and um, the lower picture only has one species. So um, the f fundamental niche of the brown species um, includes the high, like the whole intertidal zone. But if you have um, the two species in the experimental conditions on the top picture, um, you can see their realized niche is much smaller than their fundamental niche. So the presence of one barnacle species limits the realized niche of another so character displacement is the tendency for characteristics to be more divergent or more different in sympatric populations than allopatric populations. We might have to go back to Bio 160 to remember sympatric and allopatric. Sympatric is when they live together in the same area. Allopatric is when there's some sort of geographic barrier. So we have uh, two species of finches that are found on the Galapagos Islands and um, the beak depth of those finches has been measured. So there's uh, G. fuliginosa and G. fortis. And uh, so you got the orange one and the green one, right? So when they live separately on two different islands, in the first two graphs there, they're showing you that the beak depth, beak depth is about the same or the average beak depth is about the same. However, when both of those species live on the same island, um, you see that their characters have diverged, so they're more different there. Um, one species has a s smaller average beak depth and the other has a larger average beak depth when they live on the same island together or when you have sympatric populations. So exploitation is another um, interaction. This refers to any positive ne negative interaction in where one species benefits by feeding on the other while the other species is harmed. Obviously, if somebody's feeding on you, you're probably harmed. So this includes predation, herbivory, and parasitism. And we'll go over each of these coming up. But people tend to do good on these. Like you tend to have a general idea of predation, herbivory, and parasitism. 
Organisms that we consider prey do try and defend themselves from their predators, then there's different ways they do this. They can have behavioral defenses like hiding or fleeing or forming a herd or a school or active self-defense. Like, I will attack you. Don't make me, right? Um, they also have cryptic coloration, which is the fancy way to say camouflage that makes these prey items difficult to spot. They have aposematic coloration, which is warning coloration um, that tells the predator, like, stay away from me. I can defend myself. Think of a skunk. When you see a skunk, I, I go away from it. Like, I'm like, oh, you stay over there. I'll stay over here. Um, and then Bastian mimicry is when a palatable or harmless species mimics an unpalatable or harmful um, model organism. And with that mimicry, it's not like these organisms got together and had a chat about it. Um, however, um, if you look a certain way and you're able to survive and reproduce, reproduce more than organisms that don't look like that, it's going to kind of continue on. So let's match the examples here. Um, the first one is a canyon tree frog. Like you can barely even see that frog. So what's that gonna be? That's gonna be cryptic coloration, C. The next one, the poison dart frog. You can absolutely see that frog. So what's that gonna be? That is warning coloration or aposematic coloration. So that one's A. And then the last two pictures, you've got a non-venomous hawk maw hawk moth larva and a venomous green parrot snake. They don't look exactly the same, um, but if I saw that moth, I would think that it was the snake and I would definitely jump. So that is going to be um, B, Bastian mimicry. So then that brings us to herbivory. Nobody really thinks of this, but herbivores are like plant predators, right? Um, maybe if you have a garden, you think about it that way, because I we're putting our garden in, and I definitely think about herbivores as like little plant predators. So herbivores have adaptations like chemical sensors and specialized teeth or digestive systems um, for seeking and feeding on their prey, which are plants. Um, but the plants, they don't necessarily take this too well. Um, so plants have defenses, including chemical toxins and protective structures like spines and thorns. Um, our book didn't have any good pictures of this, so I found an article from Nature that did have some good pictures of plant defenses. So parasitic organisms are another kind of organism. Um, parasites often have a complex life cycle involving um, multiple hosts, and some parasites can even change the behavior of the host in a way that increases the parasite's fitness. Um, parasites often affect the survival and the reproduction and the density of the host populations, though. We can kind of classify parasites in lots of ways, but three ways we'll do it um, in this class are by talking about endoparasites, ectoparasites, and brood parasites. Endo is inside of, ecto is outside of, so endoparasites are going to live inside of their host, um, ectoparasites are going to live on the surface of their host, and then brood parasites are really interesting to me. Brood parasites actually manipulate the host to raise the parasite's young as if it was the host young. So go ahead and label the parasites as either an endoparasite, ectoparasite, or a brood parasite. The first one is a picture of a wren rearing a baby cuckoo. Look at the size of that baby cuckoo. Um, so the cuckoo actually lays its eggs in a wren's nest and sometimes they even kick out the wren's own eggs so that tiny little wren is raising that giant cuckoo. Um, if the wren was able to hatch any of its own young, um, the cuckoo can kick out the wren's young as well and the cuckoo gets fed way more than the wren's young would. So that is going to be be a brood parasite. Um, I put a tick. I feel like if you live in Missouri, you've probably seen a tick before, but I did have a class one time where somebody swore they had never had a tick, even though they lived in Missouri. So if you don't know what a tick is, there's a picture of a tick. Um, most of you know that ticks attach, um, ticks attach and suck your blood. So is that inside or outside of your body? That's outside, so that's going to be C, an ectoparasite. The last one, it's a little hard to tell what it is, maybe. Um, that's a tapeworm. Um, I'm not going to make you like identify a tapeworm on the exam, but if I told you it lived inside of your body, um, that would be an endoparasite. So that tapeworm is A, an endoparasite. So then we've got positive interactions. We ha we talked about exploitative interactions. Now we've got positive interactions. So this is when we have a positive positive or positive neutral interaction where at least one species benefits and the other is not harmed. So these two include mutualism and commensalism. So mutualism is an interspecific reaction that benefits both species. 
um, and each partner um, experiences a cost, but the benefits exceed the cost to the participants. And then commensalism is when one species benefits and the other is not harmed, um, but it's also not helped. So the clownfish um, being protected by the anemone's tentacles, um, and then the clownfish drives off the butterfly fish that would eat the anemone. I feel like lots of you know about this one because of Finding Nemo. Um, and then that would be a mutualistic example. And then here, the next picture, we've got an epiphytic plant that grows on the surface of another plant and drives its moisture and nutrients from the air or the rain or from debris accumulating around it, not from that plant. So it's not a parasitic plant, it's an epiphytic plant. However, you know, we like to put things in boxes, but they don't always fit in boxes. So the effects of the ecological interactions can change. For example, a cattle egret typically has a commensal relationship with cattle. Um, the cat, they just hang out with the cattle and then they eat um, insects around the cows as the cattle kick them up. Not the egrets, but the insects, right? Um, but occasionally a cattle egret helps remove insects that are um, predators on the cattle, so then it would be a mutualistic relationship. So, you know, we like to put everything in a neat and tidy box, but in reality, these things are not in neat and tidy boxes. So here's just kind of a picture that shows us um, predation and competition and parasitism and herbivory and all of those things and how they kind of play a role here. So, right, the fox eats the rabbit, that's predation. Um, the rabbit eats the grass, that's herbivory. Um, the deer and the rabbit are both eating grass, so they're competing with each other for the grass. And then the parasite infects the rabbit, um, so that's parasitism. So let's review what is an ecological niche. Um, I think the easiest way to think of an ecological niche is like it's like how a species makes its living. Um, so how does it acquire resources? Where does it live? Those sorts of things. So it's like its role in an ecosystem. Um, which of the following interactions are considered exploitation? So exploitation is good for one organism, bad for the other. So parasitism, good for the who? Good for the parasite, bad for the host. So parasitism is exploitation. Predation, who's that good for? Predator, who's that bad for? Prey, so that's exploitation. Mutualism, that's good for both. So that's not exploitation. Commensalism, good for one organism, neutral for the other, not exploitation. Competition is bad for both. When we talk about how communities are structured, we can talk about species diversity and also trophic structure. So species diversity is the variety of organisms that make up that community, and then trophic structure is the feeding relationships between organisms in a community. And sometimes a few species in a community have a really big role on that community structure. Species diversity, again, is... Um, the variety of organisms that make up that community and as two components, um, species richness, which is just the number of different species in a community, and the relative abundance, which is the proportion each species represents of all the individuals in the community. So two communities can have the same species richness, but have different relative abundances. So if we look at the picture down there of community one and community two, it's pretty obvious that community one is more diverse than community two, um, but they both have the same species richness because they both have, you know, the a like tree A, which is the like green one. I guess they're all green, but the yeah, tree A, tree B, tree C, and tree D. Um, they all have those trees, um, so they have the same species richness, which is four, um, but community one has more even distribution, so it has um, more diversity. So there's math for this because there's math for everything in biology. The Shannon Diversity Index is going to measure the species diversity of a community. This gives us a representative number that integrates both the evenness of the sample, so the percentage of each species, and the number of the species, so the species richness, which directly influences the percent of each species. Um, so your um, equation, you have your Shannon Diversity Index equals the sum of the proportion of individuals in species I um, multiplied by the natural logarithm of um, the proportion of individuals in species I. 
and values for real communities fall between 1.5 and 3.5, and the higher the value, the greater the diversity. And if you take ecology, um, you very well might be calculating this, but they will walk you through it. I'm just going to show you a table on the next slide that kind of shows you. So before you look at the bottom of this table and find out the chain and diversity index number, let's think about this. We've got the species found in an unlogged forest and the species found in a logged forest. You could probably figure out on your own that the unlogged forest would be more diverse than the logged forest, um, but we have to have math to, to make that uh, a valid argument. And you can see um, the chain and diversity index for the unlogged forest is 2.284. And the logged forest is 2.037. So there's more diversity in the unlogged forest than the logged forest in this example. So let's look at our picture here. Um, what's the species richness of fish species in image A and B, and which habitat is more diverse, A or B? I think it's actually easier to answer the second question first. Um, so which habitat is more diverse, A or B? Um, habitat A has more even distribution than habitat B. So habitat A is more diverse. And then species richness of fish species in A and B. Well, A has, let's see if I can count this with you. We've got an orange fish. We've got a light blue fish. We've got a green fish. We've got a dark blue fish. And we've got a purple fish. So there's five for habitat A. And then habitat B has light blue fish, orange fish, dark blue fish, purple fish, and green fish, so that also has five. So the species richness is the same, but habitat A is more diverse. So we talked about disturbances, I think, in the previous chapter, and you know, disturbances are not necessarily a bad thing. And there's this diversity stability hypothesis, which says that disturbances in species rich communities are cushioned by the large number of interacting species and would not produce as drastic as an effect as it would in a less diverse community. Um, they've actually done studies on this. So there's study plots at something called Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve, which has long-term experiments in which the researchers have manipulated plant diversity. And you can see there's a whole bunch of little patches there. And this ecosystem um, science reserve is in Minnesota, and they've studied it for two decades. And communities with higher diversity are more productive, um, and they are more stable in their productivity. They are better, better able to withstand and recover from environmental stressors. They produce more biomass than single species communities, and they're more resistant to invasive species um, than the um, low diversity communities or low diversity patches. So that brings us to your trophic structure. This is your feeding relationships between organisms in a community, and this is a key factor in community dynamics. You've probably heard of a food chain before. Um, a food chain is a relatively simplistic diagram that links trophic levels from producers to top carnivores. A food web is a more complex um, diagram that shows the more complex trophic interactions that are more likely, like this is a more realistic diagram. Um, and species may actually play a role at more than one trophic level. So here we've got um, a food web on the left hand side and you've got just kind of a simple um, terrestrial and aquatic food chain on the right hand side there. So in your food chain, you know, we just break it down into primary producers, which are like your plants or your phytoplankton. And then you've got your primary consumers, which are either herbivores or zooplankton, secondary consumers are the things that eat the primary consumers, then you have tertiary consumers, which eat the secondary consumers, and you have quaternary consumers, which eat um, the lower levels below them. So some species have a very large impact in their community, and such species are going to be either highly abundant or they play a pivotal role in their community dynamics. So Things like a dominant species or a keystone species or an ecosystem engineer have a disproportionate role in their community structure. And we'll talk about each of those coming up. So a dominant species is a species that is the most abundant in a particular area or they have the largest biomass in that particular area. And one hypothesis suggests that dominant species are the most competitive um, and they're the best at exploiting resources in their particular area. Another hypothesis is that they are the most successful at avoiding predators and disease in their particular area. Either way, they are the most abundant um, or have the most biomass for their particular area. So they have a, a big influence on that community structure. 
a keystone species exert strong control on a community by their ecological role or their niche. Um, so in contrast to a dominant species, they're not necessarily the most abundant in the community, but they have a big influence. So if we look at the shark in this case, uh, the shark is the apex predator and it feeds on the cow nose ray. The cow nose ray feeds on by bivalves and arthropods, um, so that helps maintain the bivalve and arthropod population. However, um, if we decimate the shark population, the um, cow nose ray population is going to increase to um, um, an abnormally high level, they're overpopulated, and so then they end up causing a collapse of the bivalve and, ar bivalve and arthropod population, um, which will then later impact the cow nose ray population when their food is no longer available. So without the keystone stone, like the keystone is actually part of the bridge, it's, it's highlighted in red there, like it's a special shape that all the other stones lay on um, to support the, to support the arch there. Without the keystone, the whole bridge falls apart. So without the keystone species, um, the whole community falls apart. Ecosystem engineers are sometimes called foundation species because they cause physical changes in the environment that affect the community structure. If you think about beavers creating dams and um, damming up um, streams and they um, create wetlands and that changes the entire structure. So they're literally little engineers um, changing the community structure. So there's different ways we can talk about um, what's controlling population densities in uh, communities. Um, and really neither of these is right 100% of the time. And I feel like ecology is one of those things that it's really easy to get the big picture on, or at least easier to get the big picture on. But to get the nitty gritty, it's a little bit trickier. So neither of these are right um, every single time. But we can describe either um, the bottom-up model or the top-down model. In the bottom-up model, we're saying food limitation controls population density. So um, basically, uh, the mineral nutrients determines our abundance of our primary producers. And if we have, so like plants, right? And if we have enough plants, then we're going to have more herbivores. And if we have more herbivores, we're going to have more carnivores. So that's one way we can look at it. Or we can look at it with the top-down model. This is sometimes called the trophic cascade model. And this says that predators control the herbivores and the herbivores control our plants. Um, so two different ways to look at how populations are controlled. So this picture here shows us both bottom-up control and top-down control. And it's interesting because we're looking at the same three species. Um, so on bottom-up control, we've got our plant. If we have increased plant quantity, um, that benefits the herbivores. So we get more herbivores. And then that benefits our spider in this case. If we're looking at top-down, we're saying the spider controls the grasshopper levels. And if we don't have too many grasshoppers, that means um, our host plant density is going to be higher there. Um, so you know, figuring out what's actually happening in a particular ecosystem can be challenging. So again, with ecology, like big picture, we can kind of understand it, but you know, there's some nuances that are involved. So in the past, many ecologists thought that communities were in kind of a state of equilibrium and they have this balance of nature view that focused on um, the interspecific competition as a key factor in determining what the community would look like. Um, F.E. Clements argued that um, plant communities had only one stable equilibrium, which he called a climax community, which was controlled by the climate. So, like, if you imagine what a desert looks like and where you're going to find a desert, like, a desert isn't going to grow into a pine forest, right? Um, that sort of thing. Um, but then A.G. Tansley argued that there's many potential stable um, communities that are possible depending on a combination of environmental influences. And then H.A. Gleason saw communities as kind of a chance assemblage of species with, with similar abiotic needs. So I don't care that you memorize the people. I just want you to know there's different ideas on um, how we get to a particular community in a particular area.
So some ecologists, though, argued that disturbance could keep many communities from ever reaching equilibrium. Um, again, a disturbance isn't bad. A disturbance is just an event that changes the community by removing organisms or altering resource availability. So storms or fires or floods or drought are important disturbances in many communities. So this leads to a non-equilibrium model that describes communities as constantly changing after a disturbance. We can kind of characterize um, the kinds of disturbance and um, how they play a role in community structure. So the intermediate disturbance hypothesis says that moderate levels of disturbance can foster greater diversity than either high or low levels of disturbance. If we have too high of a level of disturbance um, or a high intensity of disturbance, like or high frequency of disturbance, um, that can exclude some slow growing or slow colonizing species. But if we don't have enough disturbance, if we have a low level of disturbance, like low intensity or low frequency of disturbances, that can allow dominant species to exclude less competitive species. So this graph is just showing us um, inter the intermediate disturbance um, hypothesis kind of an action here in uh, New Zealand stream bed when flooding frequency or intensity is intermediate. So um, they have an index index of disturbance intensity on the x-axis and the number of taxa. So you can kind of think of that as like the, the um, number of different kinds of invertebrates. And you can see where the disturbance is intermediate, you have the most invertebrates found there. So the disturbance is a natural part of many communities. For example, in Yellowstone, um, Yellowstone is a good example of a non-equilibrium community because it recovers pretty quickly even after large scale fires. Ecological succession is the sequence of change in community composition after a disturbance. And there's two kinds of ecological succession, primary succession and secondary succession, um, right? Primary first, secondary second. So primary succession occurs when there's no soil yet and secondary succession occurs when you already have soil present. Um, and how succession occurs, you know, this is another thing people argue about. Um, so early arriving species and later arriving species may be linked um, but, you know, it kind of depends on your particular ecosystem. Early arrivals may facilitate the appearance of later species by making the environment more favorable, more favorable, or early species may inhibit the establishment of later species, or later species may just tolerate conditions that are created by early species but are neither helped nor hindered by them. So here's kind of a graph that shows you like a general pattern of succession. So if we start with exposed rocks, those rocks need to be broken down. So lichens and mosses come in, then we tend to get grasses and weeds, and then we get more um, mixed leafy plants, and then we get small woody plants, and then we get, you know, small trees, and then we get larger trees, and then depending on the kind of forest, you know, you get different kinds of trees. Obviously, like a desert ecosystem would not take the same path of succession, but you get the general idea there. Um, and maybe if you've seen some old fields that people stop taking care of, um, you might notice them getting to the, you know, they start off with the grasses and then they get to the mixed plant stage and then the shrubby stage and then the kind of um, small woody plants stage. So if you kind of drive around Missouri, you can see different stages of succession depending on how um, people are taking care of their fields or not taking care of their fields, I suppose. So what type of succession is represented in this picture? Um, whew, we got some stuff going on, right? So first picture, everything's fine. Second picture, the forest is on fire. Third picture, it is really on fire. Fourth picture, um, that was a really high intensity fire and there are no plants left, but what's that brown stuff? We still have soil. So this is going to be secondary succession here. Um, and really when we talk about like forest fires, I could ramble about that forever because I did some research on them. Um, but really most ecosystems that are adapted for fire are not adapted to like high intensity fires like that that would kill all of your mature trees and leave you with bare soil like they did in picture four. Um, but obviously that's a simplified diagram. So again, this picture is showing us secondary succession. Humans obviously can add to disturbances. So human activities represent the strongest disturbance in ecosystems worldwide at this point. This includes agricultural development, includes clear cutting, it includes overgrazing, includes ocean trawling, um, and human disturbances usually reduce species diversity. Um, I think though when we're in this ecosystem chapter or ecology unit, it's really easy to be hard on ourselves um, because you know you think about how horrible humans are, or actually maybe not hard on ourselves, it's easy to be hard on other people, but 
you know, you're sitting in disturbance. Wherever you're listening to this, you are part of the disturbances on ecosystems. So we'll talk later about kind of a little bit on trying to solve problems and really to solve any habitat destruction problems. Like you need to involve the people in the community and you need to get their buy-in. Um, so don't just be like, oh, those people who overgrazed. Um, it's, it's more complicated than that. That's kind of my tangent for that one. Um, some key factors affecting the latitudinal gradients are evolutionary history. Tropical communities are actually older and have had more time to accumulate new species through speciation than regions in um, the polar regions. So temperate and polar communities have had to start over repeatedly after major disturbances like glaciations. And climate in particular, sunlight and precipitation um, is pretty important. You can consider those together by measuring a community's rate of evapotranspiration, which is the evaporation of water from soil, plus transpiration, um, which is water loss from plant body surfaces. So if we look at patterns of species richness in birds in North America, um, you can see that you have very high richness in the tropics, and then um, you have very low richness in the Arctic. Um, there are some kind of odd outlier spots. Um, there's something called peninsular effects where you're going to have low species richness there. And then um, mountains have high richness um, because you have such a variety of habitats. So there's lots of like niches, different organisms can kind of fill there. Um, this graph is showing you potential evapotranspiration rate and vertebrate species richness. So as the evapotranspiration rate increases, generally speaking, you're going to support more species there. The species area curve is going to, again, quantify that area effect idea. So quantify the idea that all other factors being equal, a larger geographic area has more species. I island biogeography is the study of succession on islands, and it's pretty interesting to me at least. Um, uh, the island equilibrium model says that species richness will reach a dynamic equilibrium where immigration is balanced by extinction and the number of species at the equilibrium point is a function of the island size and the distance from the mainland. So smaller islands are generally going to have lower immigration rates and higher extinction rates and closer islands to the mainland are going to receive more immigrants and have lower rates of extinction. So if we look at this picture here, um, these two graphs have um, on their x-axis is the relationship between species richness and island size, and then you have the species on the y-axis in the logarithmic scale. So you can see there's a general trend where species richness increases with island size there. Um, this image is showing us um, the distance from the mainland and the percentage of bird species, and you can see generally as the distance from the mainland increases, the percentage of bird species is going to decrease. Ecological communities of all kinds are universally affected by pathogens, which again are just disease-causing microorganisms and viruses, and pathogens can have a very dramatic effect on community structure when they're introduced into new habitats. I think we're sort of distinctly aware of that now, right? Um, human activities, as we know, are transporting pathogens around the world at unprecedented rates, and um, you know, I made this slide before this whole thing happened, um, but community ecology is really needed to help study and combat pathogens. Like we need a science-based approach to understanding pathogens and reducing their spread. So a couple important pathogens from um, an ecology perspective, um, coral reef communities are being decimated by white band disease, which may be linked to vibro bacterium. Um, and sudden oak death. If you see like those trees, there's the green ones and there's all the brown ones in there. Um, all those brown ones are um, oaks that have succumbed to sudden oak death. Um, and if your oak trees die, then the organisms that live in those oak trees are not going to be able to have um, their habitat either. 
so we made it through this chapter. I think this one was pretty straightforward for the most part. Um, it's, <laughs> although it's hard to define competition without saying competition, right? But you can say competition is an interaction um, that is negative for both species. Exploitation is good for one species and bad for the other and includes predation, herbivory, and parasitism. Mutualism is beneficial for both and commensalism is good for one. Um, but neutral for the other. Those are all types of symbiotic relationships. Um, then we have a niche, which is how a species makes its living. You've got species richness, which is the number of species in a particular area. Diversity includes the number of species and um, the amount of those species. And then we talked about uh, the diversity and stability hypotheses where you have um, high diversity communities tend to be more stable. We also talked about the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. So if we have intermediate disturbances, we tend to have a higher rate of diversity. And then we just talked about the different trophic levels. So something like a food chain or a food web um, with your primary producers, um, which would be like your plants or phytoplankton. And then you've got consumer, you've got primary consumers, secondary consumers, um, and tertiary and quaternary consumers there at your different trophic levels.